Hello and welcome to episode 258 of the Thinking LSAT podcast in Vienna, Virginia. This is Ben Olson. With me today is uh, Mike Dingerno. But Bujaner. <laughs> Buongiorno. Now, now you got me all mixed up because I'm thinking about the pizza. <laughs> Legit. Yeah. Okay. Well, I just can't do this at all. Anyways, um, Mike, you're in Delaware. Yes. Where in Delaware? We are uh, at Rehoboth Beach. Oh, okay. Yeah, Rehoboth is great. Although they it just great. They just had a, a spike. A on. hurricane. <laughs> a hurricane. Wow, it was a tropical and, storm. Oh, okay. And and, and a spike in uh, COVID cases, right? Um, I, that I don't know about. Uh, so we had rented this that, house. You're like, I, I don't know about that. So you don't have any like, uh, reservations. You're good. Um, well, I think we're, you know, I've been now in lockdown with the kids, uh, for four, five months and they haven't been in school. Um, yeah. we have three kids, so okay. it was time to get out. Um, but you know, we're taking all the precautions, wearing the masks, staying six feet apart. We're just going to the beaches. So, um, Cool. Yeah, I was just up in Lewis uh, Beach, which is like 30 minutes or 20 minutes north of there, I think. Um, but anyway, cool. I'm glad you're on the show. For everyone who does not know Mike, Mike is a former student of mine. Nathan is off like golfing or something like that. Um, good luck to him. I hope he, uh, I was going to say gets lots of points, but actually I don't think he wants points. I hope he gets very few points. <laughs> and uh, is successful with his friends doing that. Um, in any case, today on the show, we're going to talk about an update from LSAC on new testing limits, and then we're just going to jump into an interview with you, Mike, about your experience at Georgetown, your experience preparing for the LSAT, all this stuff. It's great to see you. I don't know how many years it's been. When yeah, did you start studying for the LSAT. How long ago was that? So let's see, I reached out to you when I was in Hawaii and I think that was 2016. And okay. uh, that, so I had done your in-person, a few, a few weeks of your in-person class, which was great. Um, but uh, anyway, yeah, it's been a few years. So it was 2016 was when I um, started okay. doing it. Wow, remotely. a lot has happened. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, all right, this is going to air on Monday, August 10th. Uh, the deadline for the October LSAT is August 21st. For those of you who are considering it, the August LSAT Flex Week starts Saturday, August 29th. Um, wow, the November LSAT deadline is September 30th. <laughs> so for those of you who are thinking that far ahead, Make sure to register before the end of September. Um, and the October LSAT is on October 3rd. As of now, it's still scheduled to be an in-person test. It's really hard for me to see that actually being administered in person. Um, I was just reading something the other day, too. I think that even if a vaccine comes out, you know, you have to distribute it to people. So you're going to have to start with uh, the people on the front lines, like nurses and people who are most susceptible to the virus. So elderly folks, and it's just going to take a long time for it to have an effect that I think we're looking for. I mean, I'm not an expert in that, but when it comes to the LSAT, it's like October, really? We're going to do that in person? I just don't see that happening. Yeah, I mean, most most states have even pushed off their bar exams that they're online in October. So I, I just don't see how they would do it in person. LSAT yeah, test. and schools are going virtual, right? And I just heard yeah. about another school last night, uh, Maryland, that's going all virtual, at least at the beginning. I think it would be easier for LSAC uh, and for everybody else in the world that cares about this LSAT stuff just to say, look, we're going to be virtual until spring of next year. And that's what, you know, you know, it was the same with the school systems. Like we have three kids in the schools. So I was like, just make a decision so we can plan. If you're not going to yep. do it, just make your decision and then we'll go, you know, but mm -hmm. I need to know, stop waffling back and forth. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. We yeah. had the same thing here in uh, Fairfax County. It was just like, they, you know, they were trying to accommodate everybody's wishes. So you could, 
select to do it in person or totally online or <laughs> they even talk about homeschooling yeah. and it's like, okay, because it's not the end of the world, right? You just decide that it's going to be virtual and everybody may be unhappy about that, but at least it's known. And even if everybody got healthy and the virus right. or the vaccine was perfect. <laughs> yeah, no. And I actually think like this, like, like two days a week or split classes. I mean like that, that would be awful. I was like, how do I, schedule around that, you know, mm -hmm. taking the kids in on Tuesdays and Thursdays, but the next week it's going to be Mondays and Wednesdays. It's like, this is, this isn't going to work. Uh, is, you know, it should be, you know, either do it or don't do it. But um, yeah, the, it, it's been a mess. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so I, I, I'm predicting right now, October is going to, the October LSAT is going to be a flex test, which is their new term for their online test, which is only three sections, by the way. Did you know this? Yeah, so that was, I had never heard of what a flex test was. And I listened to a previous podcast of yours just recently, and that was the first time I heard of it. So yeah, they cut it to three, and then they're all weighed one third of, of the mm -hmm. test. Yeah. yeah. So LR is now not half, but one third, which is interesting. Um, and so I'm guessing that October will be flex. I'm guessing that Wait, I don't think there is an, is there? there yeah, there is a November LSAT. We just read about that. So I bet the November will be flex. Mm -hmm. And maybe January would be in person, but I I don't know. It's just really hard to see that happening. Yeah, I just don't think anyone's going to be doing it. I think it, your best bet is to prepare for the flex is mm -hmm. what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, if you're listening to the show, you can always email us questions at help at thinkinglsat.com. Include your selfies if you're so brave. Leave a review on iTunes. That helps all the time. Uh, I'm just going to jump into this email from Eric at LSAC telling us about their updated policy on testing limits. Mike, you're always welcome to jump in at any moment. Tell us what you think. Um, this says, Dear Ben, I'm writing to let you know of an update to our policy limiting the number of times a candidate may test. As you know, we established a test taking limit policy that went into effect with the September 2019 LSAT. The policy was forward looking only. Any exams taken previously by candidates do not count against their limits. While this policy affects only a very small number of test takers, it is necessary to ensure a fair and equitable testing program and maintain the integrity of the LSAT. I, I have, I wonder if that's their actual motivation. I have no idea what their actual motivation is, but um, under the existing policy, starting with the September 2019 test administration, test takers are permitted to take the LSAT three times in a single testing year. And by the way, a testing year goes from June 1st to May 31st. So, for most people, the t they can only take the LSAT three times uh, or maybe five. The next rule says, look, you can take it at most five times within the current and five most recent testing periods or previous testing periods. So, I mean, this is LSAC's lawyerly and wordy way of saying for the past five years, essentially, or I guess almost six you're limited to five times. So you're limited to three times within the current cycle and five times within the last six years. So for the vast, vast majority of people, they can never take it more than five times. That said, okay. the flex LSATs, and then they have this other rule, it says a total of seven times over a lifetime, uh, which again is very rare for the vast majority of people. Um, but when they started administering the flex tests in, I think it was, geez, did they start that in May? I think they started in May. Those tests, they did not count towards this testing limit. So if someone took it in May and then again in, I can't remember the dates now, but maybe June and then again in July and then August, none of those flex tests would have counted towards their limits. So they could get in a lot of tests yeah. and people were making decisions about whether or not to take it based on this, right? They're like, Hey, it's not going to count. Might as well just take it, especially since schools generally take the highest score, or I should say essentially always take the highest score. Um, but now LSAC is saying, okay, with the introduction of the LSAT flex, 
to provide a safe and effective mechanism for candidates to earn scores during the COVID-19 emergency. Okay. LSAC made the decision that the May, June, July, and August LSAT flex test do not count towards these limits. That's what we were just talking about. Oh, I got all the test dates right. However, in light of the ongoing COVID-19 situation, we are announcing a change to that policy. And this is all bold. Should the LSAT flex be administered after August 2020, which it will be, uh, LSAT flex test after the August 2020 administration will count toward LSAT testing limits. Again, this policy change related to LSAT flex is forward looking only. So if you've taken the August LSAT or, or if you do take the August LSAT or you've taken July or June or May, none of those are going to count towards your testing limit, but the October LSAT, regardless of whether it's flex or in person, will count towards your limit. That's what they're saying. I mean, actually, now, you know, we were just talking about how they're going to make the October LSAT flex. This is like basically acknowledging that it's going to be flex. Yeah. If they're already looking forward and saying, look, we're counting these uh, <laughs> going forward. Yeah. Yeah. They're definitely thinking about that. Yeah. Or have made that decision. <laughs> I think they have. Yeah. They, they realize that, but they're just not, I don't know why they're not willing to pull the trigger, but anyway, so yeah, Eric, thank you. Um, that is going to be uh so now how long have they had uh testing limits on the lsat well they've actually had it for a really long time they they for the longest time geez it's i'm starting to get like forgetful here but for some reason in my head there was like you had a lifetime limit of three a long time ago like you could only take it three times and that was it and so I remember a lot of, you know, people would take it twice and there'd be this huge anxiety for the third attempt because it's like, okay, this is it. This is your last chance. Right. Um, and then they had an about face like two years ago, maybe. And they said, Hey, no limits whatsoever, which was like, the, everybody's like, what? Oh my gosh. And so now they could take it. And some people were taking it seven times crazy. I mean, most people weren't, but they're like, Hey, uh, Schools are going to take the highest score. So not okay. take it again? schools were still taking the highest score if you've taken it seven times. Yeah. I mean, I could imagine an admissions official looking at that and saying like, wow, you, yeah. can you, can you pull it together and just like <laughs> wait until you're ready to right. execute as opposed to just like willy nilly taking it a bunch of times. So I can imagine that it didn't look great at the same time, you know, when push comes to shove, the numbers are what matter because ultimately the school doesn't care. It does care about you as a candidate, but really it cares about how it looks on U.S. News and World Report. And exactly. they only have to report the highest score. So yeah. if you're a 170 with seven tests and you have another applicant who's a 168 with one test, although the 168 looks like they have their shit together more, mm -hmm. the 170 is going to help them. Yeah, in a way that the no, 168 I, I, is not. So, <laughs> yep. No, I, I agree. It's that number that they can report um, that matters. So, yeah. Well, also, I mean, if they're putting a limit on the flex, it sounds like it, they're giving it more legitimacy. They're saying this is, you know, the real deal. We're going to start tagging you for it, um, hmm. just like we do the, the actual sit down uh, exam. Yeah. Um, so actually, it could be a good thing in the long run. Um, Colleges will look at it with more uh, respect. I don't know if they're not. Um, I don't know if they care. Like you said, a, a score is the score. I, do, I mean, I don't think they have to report whether or not the score came from the flex or the in-person exam. So, I don't think they do to the U.S. News and World Report right. ranking. They do. They do get notified that it was a flex test. I mean, they would just know that too because of the date that it was administered. But it is indicated as such on everyone's score transcript so they do know that but i don't think they have to report that so yeah but you're right i mean this is probably just another step into the direction of let's make this test online forever which would be yeah. awesome yep <laughs> cool well we had some other emails but i think we'll tackle them on the next show because i want to jump into our interview with you mike like okay Let's go back to the beginning. So 2016, you were in D.C. Yeah. Yeah, I was in D.C. Um, uh, 
Well, if you want to go way back to the beginning, uh, just real <laughs> you quick. You were born. Uh, okay. <laughs> um, so I'm I just, so everyone knows, I'm a little older. I'm 37, just graduating from law school. So I'm about 10 years behind my cohort. Um, but I was a, uh, a mechanic in the Navy uh, from uh, 2001, uh, uh, right before 9-11 to 2005. Met my wife. She was also enlisted. Uh, mm -hmm. We got out. We got married. Um, she wanted to be a doctor, so she went to uh, undergraduate um, school, and I worked as an appliance repairman uh, for five years. Um, and then she ended up getting her degree and then we switched. So then it was my turn to go to school. Uh, mm -hmm. I had always wanted to be a lawyer. Um, and then, uh, I pursued that goal. So fast forward to 24, 2016. Well, if we could go 2014 is when I, uh, first started thinking about taking the LSAT, um, seriously. And actually you were, um, I went to, I signed up and, and, uh, went to your in-person class in dc um and i took my first i had never i you know i'm i, I don't know what the lsat is uh so i yeah. sit down and you gave us a diagnostic oh okay uh, I, so wait you were signed up for the class or like a free trial or something no or? like in your class i was oh okay okay in your class um and i scored like a 142 i okay. it was awful awful <laughs> um and, but hey just to clarify that might feel awful but most people start between like 140 and 155 like in fact i would say most people start between 140 and 150 so yeah. if they're above 150 i'm like wow that's a great starting score so 142 that's like pretty normal but i'm sure it didn't feel good it was just like oh no what is it <laughs> <laughs> um you know, uh, not what I expected, but it, you know, that's why you take the prep exam. That's where your starting point is. It's not where you're going to end up. Um, mm -hmm. it's just, you know, this is, it's a good measuring point. Um, mm -hmm. and what happened was, um, like I said, uh, you know, I had been married, we had two kids, there was a lot going on and the LSAT was coming and I was just like, I'm terrified. And I yeah. just to totally pulled the, the ripcord and I just ejected. I just stopped. Um, oh. Wait, stopped. did you stop coming to class? You had paid I for stopped class? coming to class and everything. Oh, I was man. like, I'm done. Yeah. <laughs> um, I had never taken a standardized exam. Mm -hmm. I mean, I hadn't taken a standardized exam. I took the SATs, um, mm -hmm. you know, when I was 17. So it had been yeah. um, a while. And I had yeah. severe test anxiety about it. I Okay was very concerned and I just took over and I just, it was the LSAT day. I told my wife, I'm going to go take the LSAT, you know, maybe, I don't know. Yeah. And she's like, well, you haven't been going to the class. I was like, I don't know what to do. <laughs> um, and I ended up watching a, going to the movie theater instead. Oh, you're just like, totally. I, just like I, I was like on my way to the testing center and I just like, ah, I'm just going to go to the AMC. What movie did you watch? I watched, um, it was terrible. Um, who's that guy who does, Family Guy. Family Guy. The animator. The uh, yeah. He's, he's Matt. He's famous. Matt. Whatever. Uh, it was a cowboy movie that he had done with Liam Neeson. And oh, uh, is that the uh, the aliens and cowboys and aliens? No, movie? no, that's that's a different movie. This is um, it was a comedy. Oh, okay. it was terrible. It was terrible. Okay. Anyway, it doesn't matter. It so was it was just a really bad day all all the way around. <laughs> <laughs> um. So then my wife, you know, she graduated from medical school. She's in the Navy um, yeah. and uh, she got stationed in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was like, be doing the stay at home dad thing while also taking some uh, online classes. I really enjoy education. I really enjoy learning. I, I, and uh, I was like, I do not want to be a stay at home dad my whole life. This is not what I want to do. Um, yeah. and I really always wanted to go to law school. So I was like, uh, you know, I got it. I got to bite the bullet. And I'd reach out to you by email. Yeah. And I okay. said, Hey, do you have an online program? And you're like, no, but like, <laughs> I'm thinking about it. Uh, yeah. can I, can, Hey, you want to like test this out and see how it goes? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and I was like, yeah. Um, and I ended up, you had these videos you'd send me, you sent me the books and materials. I could email mm -hmm. you questions. It was really chill. Um, and I ended up taking the LSAT 
in 2016 doing okay. I did, I did fine. It was in the one sixties. I, it yeah. wasn't a one seventy or anything like that, but yeah, it was yeah. fine. Yeah. And, um, and I only have ever taken the LSAT once, you know, yeah. just that one, one time. And yeah. then I could only apply to like three schools. So I applied to, because my, where my wife would be stationed next. Yeah. Um, yeah. and I could only apply to, you know, San wait, Diego. so Mike, hold up. You don't remember your score. That feels like something that people I don't just... remember exactly what it was. It was in the ones I know you think I remember the worst score I got. I don't remember yeah. <laughs> my my actual score. That's all right. I mean, um, hey, that shows a healthy attitude about this whole like testing process, right? People are obsessed with the exact score and Yeah. And I do want to talk about that a little bit too with you about because it um it, your score is very important. It's not the only thing though. And that's the same with grades. It's, it's mm -hmm. they are very important. You cannot, I mean life is a lot easier if you do really well, but yeah, anyway, we can get yeah. into that. But um, yeah, so anyway, I could only apply to three schools. I applied to Georgetown Law, uh, George Washington, mm -hmm. um, and San Diego. Um, and I got uh, um, aid from San Diego and, and George Washington, and I, but George, Georgetown accepted me, so I took it. Um, hmm. What was your GPA? Is it, I mean, my GPA was a three, nine. Oh, okay. So you're um, doing but, well on that front. Yeah. But this kind of goes back to what you were saying earlier about, it's just really about the number. Cause I went to community college mm -hmm. and uh, when I got accepted, I mean, it was community college. It, and then yeah. I went to uh, uh, Georgetown. When I got accepted to Georgetown, my wife who had gone to medical school, she's like this, she's like, you, you don't know what you're getting yourself into these yeah, kids yeah. are not what you've been competing against yeah, yeah, yeah. you know what i mean yeah i was like oh don't worry about it i got this down and, <laughs> i got and, in um, <laughs> yeah i got in i'm solid and yeah. uh you know then you're like talking to these other students and like oh where'd you go it's like harvard and you're like oh where'd you go yale where'd you go princeton wow and you're like yeah. talking to these 25 year olds are like yeah i was in this uh political campaign i worked in the white house i was like Oh God, you know, I just was fixing washing machines a few years ago. <laughs> um, so anyway, wow. uh, yes, yeah, so I got in and I took Georgetown and, and one of the driving factors about Georgetown was, was the fact that it has a national presence and my wife is in the Navy and, and if yeah. we have to move, I have to be able to move and get a job. Sure. Um, so, yeah. so, you know, I don't know if you want to talk about picking a school, but the, that is very important. Yeah. Um, uh, so yeah, that's, so that's why of, you turned down the money at other schools. Cause you wanted that. Yeah, it was more important to me. And so, um, you know, I, I actually listened to a couple of your podcasts and I know Nathan, um, and you are, are, are big on getting as, as much money as possible and even turning down higher ranked mm -hmm. schools for that mm -hmm. money. Um, uh, that is, a, a serious consideration. I wouldn't say it's the only consideration. Um, and I don't think you guys do either, but it's definitely, you have to know very clearly before you pick a school where you want to work, mm -hmm. what you want to do, mm -hmm. um, you know, where you want to be in 10, 15 years, you have to have this planned out really well. Mm -hmm. Um, and I didn't, uh, and I got lucky, um, mm -hmm. but I got lucky. So, mm -hmm. you know, I've met brilliant lawyers who have gone to no ranked school. You know, I mean, they're just, you know, I, I don't know if they're even on the, on the list, but maybe like 175 or something. Yeah. Um, and they've gone for free because they did great on their uh, getting into it. Um, but they wanted to work in a small town and where all the alumni are graduates from that school and mm -hmm. where they're going to get a job. Um, and that's really, you know, the smart move that you should yeah. do that. Mm -hmm. um, but if you know you want to be an appellate lawyer or a litigator, or you definitely know you want to go to a big firm, um, it may, it would behoove you to go to the highest ranking school you can go to unless, but, but with, with the caveat, it needs to be in the top 25, mm -hmm. top 50 maybe of schools. Like past that, it really wouldn't matter and even in those top schools you really got to be up close to the top 14 
you know, definitely top 20 um, to get into those positions. So if that's not where you are and that's mm -hmm. the track you want to take, you know, don't go to a lower rank school and expect to be able to, to uh, break in um, yeah. unless you plan to transfer, you know, yeah. like you start, you do your one L year somewhere and then transfer into one of those higher schools, uh, yeah. higher rank schools. Um, well, so, I mean, I, I, I guess one thing I think people need to be aware of is that what it sounds like you're saying is you, if you want to practice in big law or you want to get a clerkship or something like that, you need the ranking to do that. Um, so for some people that may mean going to the highest rank school that you can get into, but I think you're also saying, Hey, wait a sec. As long as you get into the tier of schools that allows for those opportunities, then it might make more sense to actually go to the lowest rank school still in that tier, right? Like essentially there's the top 20 and then there's a yeah. bunch of other schools below that. And as long as you get in the top 20, if you go to like, let's say you go to, you know, a school ranked 18 versus a school ranked 12. Well, it's lower ranked, but at the same time, you might be going for free and getting higher grades, which are going to matter a lot, right? Once you start applying for those jobs. Yeah. So what's going to happen is um, what you have to do at Georgetown. So you're ranked 14 and you're competing. Mm -hmm. So say you want to do a federal clerkship. That's yeah. where you want to be. Yeah. Um, you know, you're going to be competing against students out of, you know, Yale, Harvard, Columbia, Stan, you know, mm -hmm. pick your, pick your top 10. So you need to be in that top 10% at Georgetown to mm -hmm. compete grade wise. Yeah. Um, however, uh, so, so I guess what, so that will trickle down. So if you're going to be in the 20th, you know, mm -hmm. ranked 18th, now you will have mm -hmm. gone to, for free, uh, mm -hmm. but you need to be in the top percent, you know, you need to be literally that top person. Do you feel like it's that, team. it's that, um, stark? Like it, it I, it is. <laughs> okay. Um, it really is. I mean, I just, I, well, I've taken classes with a, a couple of, um, federal judges. Um, okay. And they'll just tell you, you know, uh, they get a thousand applicants. Mm -hmm. So the first, you know, they're like, we're not going to read half of these. This is, we're, we got to cut it down to 500 or 200. Mm -hmm. So I'm just mm -hmm. going to take from the top three schools. Boom. Okay. So everyone else doesn't even get a look. Boop. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and now I'm going to take from those schools. I'm going to take out of Harvard. I'll take out of the top 15% out of, you know, the Columbia I'll take out of the top 5% mm -hmm. and then you cut mm -hmm. them. So now you have mm -hmm. 20 applicants mm -hmm. just, you know, it's just a heuristic. It's a, it's a quick way to just cut. It doesn't mm -hmm. mean that those other applicants aren't just as smart or hardworking or couldn't do mm -hmm. the job better than the person who actually ends up with the position. It's just a way for very busy judges to very quickly cut through mountains of applications. Mm -hmm. um, so is that every judge? No, no, that's not every judge. I'm sure there are judges that really look um, more deeply at the, at the candidate. I know there are, mm -hmm. um, but I would say for the majority, like if, if we're talking about a general rule, that's mm -hmm. the general rule. Yeah. Um, now, that doesn't mean you can't um, figure out ways to enhance your ability, even if you go to a lower tiered school. So you would look at judges that graduated from your school. That's a great mm -hmm. way. So they're gonna mm -hmm. look at you, you know, and if you're mm -hmm. the top person at that school, um, then, then that's really good. You're gonna get a look. Um, also faculty really matter. Mm -hmm. Um, so this what is another, that? so yeah, this is another consideration when you're, when you're picking a school. Um, I know that, uh, so you may not get, get the best, um, educators at the highest ranking schools. They may not be very good teachers, uh, necessarily, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. 
but they are well connected. And if you impress people um, that mm -hmm. are well connected because they mm -hmm. are leaders in their fields, mm -hmm. um, it can open doors, even if you don't have the highest GPA. Yeah, uh, you can overcome, um, and we can talk about this. Like if you have run into a setback in one L year, uh, you mm -hmm. can overcome obstacles. Um, but it, I mean, really, what it comes down to is. <laughs> Um, rank matters, mm -hmm. uh, depending. And like I said, this is all caveat with, with, with it matters depending on what you want to do with your career. That's mm -hmm. all. It, it yeah. does not matter if, if a clerkship's not your jam or a, um, big law job is, is not your, your, uh, cons you know, you're, you're not something you want to chase. Um, yeah. So I, I just think that it is, all these things have to be really well thought out before you pick a school and, and choose to go in a certain direction. Yeah, well, so let's talk a little bit more about like what you, you decided to go to Georgetown and your decision you s said was somewhat lucky, right? Like you basically were like, hey, I want national reach. You ended up going there and you didn't know what you were up against. What happened first year? Yeah, so... Um, it, it was a mess. I, um, I think that, so first, the, the problem that I ran into, I took a, um, it's not experimental, but at Georgetown you have a, um, it, it's called section three and it's more philosophical about how the law operates in society. Um, this is a class. It's called section. No, no, three. this is your whole curriculum. So you take torts and contracts, for example, and I don't expect yeah. your listeners necessarily to know this, but as yeah. one class, they're smashed together. Um, okay. hmm. You take, uh, you know, instead of con law one, you take uh, democracy and coercion. Uh, okay. It's just a little bit more bent on. Actually, I heard Nathan in one of your podcasts say something about, you know, the law is made up and, yeah. and the philosophy is in that section. Yeah, the law is all made up or not. You know? yeah, yeah. And they want to <laughs> expose you to that. Um, that's really, that's interesting because, you know, the ABA has these requirements yeah. that law schools, all law schools, if you want to get accredited, provide this um, curriculum that meets these certain standards. So it sounds like so Georgetown meets, is obviously meeting them, but it meets the standard. So you learn all contract law, you learn tort mm -hmm. law. Um, but it's almost like a background noise to the, to the, the uh, real message that they want to real give message you. that they're put that, that they're pushing through. What's their um, bent? Their bent is that the law is made up. Yeah. Um, so it's like, if, if you're talking about like the public private distinction and how mm -hmm. this isn't actually a, a distinction, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's this is, you know, and, and judges want to pretend that, yo, no, there's a clear bright line between these two things and we can make, you know, this is the government acting, but this is a private actor. Yeah. And we can say, you're talking about these, like exact, like uh, what's it called again? The, the immunity or um, privilege or something like that. So there's government action. There's, immunity, right? There's, you're talking about this is uh, what's the term for it again? Uh, when, like when you're in, like if you're an elected official, right, and you make sovereign a immunity. You're talking about sovereign immunity. Is that sovereign immunity? I, I don't remember. No, the this term. is this is different. No, sovereign it's, immunity has to do with like that's like like with foreign governments and stuff, right? No, I'm no, thinking that's of a, what, yeah. Go ahead. That's what the state. So a state is has sovereign immunity against suits. Um, from private individuals. Um, oh, okay. I was, so what oh, I'm yeah. talking oh, about yeah. is That's like- That's true. I'm thinking about the individual. When the individual makes decisions that end up hurting people, right? But they get immunity because it's like, oh no, I was acting as governor as opposed to as an individual. Are these yeah, the so under sovereign immunity is um, younger, it's the younger doctrine, I think. And, and you can okay. do a state official in his capacity, his name. Yeah, uh, you can't name the state, but you, you it's just a it's a fiction. And then yeah. you sue the in, individual and you can get an injunction against that person for acting unconstitutionally. When in reality, the state legislature passed the unconstitutional law in the first place. And that guy's only enforcing, enforcing it. it. Okay. Yeah. 
Is this what you're uh, talking about? The distinction or are you talking? About no, else? my distinction is a little different and it would be like, um, uh, you know, you had, um, private individuals, um, segregating their privately held hotels saying, look, African Americans can only, you know, uh, stay on this side of the house and, and whites can only stay on this side of the house, or we're just not going to cater to African Americans. Mm -hmm. And, um, in the beginning of the 20th century, essentially you had the, the court saying, look, that's, they're, they're private actors. Like we, you know, the 14th Amendment doesn't apply to them. It, it applies mm -hmm. to the states. Uh, so if the government was making a law that mm -hmm. was being discriminatory, that's one thing. But these guys can discriminate all they want. Mm -hmm. um, and what the um, classes that I took, you know, stated was like, look, yeah, but if you get enough private individuals doing something that's horrendous, like segregating people or refusing to um, serve them, you can essentially create a situation where they're acting just as if the government had passed a law. Mm -hmm. And so where is this distinction? There isn't, you know, the, people are still being harmed. Um, so it's not as clean cut as you think it is. is and the so Shelley we, V. Kramer case, is that, one, is that, is that is where that, that started to change? Shelley V. Kramer? Um, I, I don't remember that case. I feel like that, that was one in which they were like, hey, we're going to even the state was effectively enforcing the contracts that were. Oh, right. Yeah. 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 The, um, yeah. Was that the, um, there were like covenants, like you couldn't sell your house to, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yes, exactly. That's exactly. That's a perfect example. And I was like, wait a second. But the way they did it was they said, well, yeah, it's a private contract, but yeah, you have to go to a court to get it enforced and, <laughs> and the court is a state actor. So, yeah, but yeah, that's yeah. exactly right. So they started finding exceptions and blowing it up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's what we learned about the, the problem is, uh, mm -hmm. in one L year, yeah. the law matters. Uh, there are rules. Um, mm -hmm. you need to know how to apply those rules. It's very mechanical. Um, and if you can do that very effectively, I, I think in you know, my buddy, he was an engineer and he was an amazing test taker. Um, mm -hmm. and it was just, it was, you know, he'd make a list of the rules and he'd say, okay, yeah. I now have to find a fact in this fact pattern of the test that I'm taking and just fit it in. And mm -hmm. he was just, you know, scooting rules into the test. Meanwhile, I'm sitting next to him going on this philosophical rant about utilitarianism <laughs> and uh, the effect of content. You know what I mean? And I just yeah. didn't see the forest from the trees. Mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. totally, um, you know, I thought when my CIFRO professor went off for an hour about a suitor, a justice suitor concurrence on whether yeah. or not, uh, you know, something's in the stream of commerce, that was important. And I was yeah. like, no, that wasn't important. Yeah. You know, <laughs> what was important is this one sentence, which is, uh, you know, for a state to have personal jurisdiction over a company, the company has to put something in the stream of commerce and has to like make an affirmative act towards the state. That's all yeah. I had to remember. You know, yeah. meanwhile, I'm, I'm just, so, um, so the professors were being philosophical. They love to engage in that debate and that's what they're really, you know, entertained by and why they're glad to be your professor. But the test is practical. It's very practical. Yeah. So the test is always going to be practical. And mm -hmm. if you can do a one sentence quote from what your professor said on one day that you think will really tickle the professor, throw it in there. Mm -hmm. Um, and that might differentiate you from a, a, a from an A minus, but mm -hmm. it's not going to make a B an A. <laughs> mm -hmm. You, you need to know really, um, how to look very broadly and globally, uh, mm -hmm. about the law, quickly apply it. You have to be a very good writer. You mm -hmm. have to be a very good legal writer. I was a very bad legal writer. I didn't know mm -hmm. what they wanted. Um, mm -hmm. And this is very important. You need to very quickly, uh, when you get to school, um, recognize any weaknesses you have very mm -hmm. quickly and mm -hmm. really work on fixing those weaknesses. So, you know, I always knew that I was a slow reader and a um, writing was a, a tough thing for me. So, but I didn't jump on that. Um, really early on in, in law school um, because I didn't know that 
the way I was doing it was wrong. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah. And it's really important to uh, go to, um, you know, when you're writing your first, well, I, I heard another one of your listeners talking about this, which is totally true. There's going to be test banks uh, for each of your professor and you're going to see, you know, their best scoring exams. And it's really important that you look at that. It's really important that you practice doing those tests and applying those mm -hmm. laws and actually mm -hmm. writing out the test. And yeah. um, it's really important to then take that written out exam and take it to your school's tutoring um, people and say, is this what, is this how I should be setting it up? Is this what it yeah. should look like? Um, yeah. And your writing professor, take uh, your writing class very seriously. Um, mm -hmm. I think I kind of blew it off and I, I think that really bit me in the butt. Mm -hmm. um, and when you get bad grades, uh, which I did, uh, I didn't do well in 1L. Um, I did fine, uh, but I was definitely not, uh, I think I was in the bottom third. So um, I had like four B pluses and three Bs. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, at that point in time, what you need to do is just reflect on what you're doing wrong. Um, mm -hmm. And if you don't know what you're doing wrong, go to your professors with your tests and sit down yeah. with them and go through those. And they're going to yeah. show you. Um, is that what you ended up doing? Yeah. So what I ended up doing was I had these two wonderful faculty members in my 1L year that mm -hmm. said, Mike, we know you know the law, um, yeah. but like you're not... Um, getting it to us on in the yeah. written word and you're also going yeah. on these philosophical tangents what is this <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um and so i sat down with them and then and then they they you know they helped but what really helped what really mm. really helped was going to that one l summer uh job because you do mm. your your summer job now i knew yeah. just really to preface it i knew i did not want to do big law I yeah. never want to do big law. This is not something I'm, I'm either going to go into the government or into, um, uh, um, uh, what's it called? Public, um, public interest, public interest. Yeah. Public interest. Okay. The thing I want to do that I can't remember. <laughs> um, so Just I knew them. I wanted, wanted to, <laughs> wanted to do, I'm studying for the bar exam. So my brain is absolutely chock full of just, it's so hard to garbage. think right now. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Garbage. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, and I had a great mentor at yeah. that firm. Um, yeah. And he worked with me and got my writing to where it I said, Bob, I can't write. And he goes, no, yeah. you can't. You stink. <laughs> and uh, I said, now, so that's another thing. It's very important. You need to be able to take criticism mm -hmm. if you want to get better. Yeah. And like, just know that these people really want to help you. You know, it's, yeah. it's not about belittling you. Don't be proud. Go get the help. You have to uh -huh. just be very willing to acknowledge that you have flaws and you need to fix them if you want to get better. Yeah. Um, and uh, so, you know, he worked with me for a couple of weeks um, and he's like, Mike, just write. Like, I don't want to read this thing write it like I don't want to read it, you know, like just what I need. Uh, mm -hmm. Get to the point. Be clear. Mm -hmm. Just write like you talk. You yeah. Know, if you and I was like, okay, great. Uh I'll do that. And <laughs> I um then bought every book by Brian Garner and Ross yeah. Guberman. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. um I did you just know started... I worked for Ross Guberman for five years? No way. I did, yeah. So um helped a lot with um point made i guess yeah you read that book mm -hmm. yeah like it's all ear yeah you you helped write that yeah yeah i was working for him and we um that's what we that's like that was a big part of my job is working with him to find cases and all that, that stuff. is an amazing book ben yeah yeah i had no idea yeah go check the cover out there's there's uh, my name's got to be in there somewhere so Oh wow! Hey, to be clear, he wrote it, but you know, no, no, no. But I, I helped as much as I could, so you're part of it. Yeah. Um. So that's really cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. I love that book. I, yeah. I live by that book. Um. And and I don't recommend reading these books if you're not, if you haven't already been exposed 
you know, I don't think it would mm -hmm. do much good to read them before one L. Um, yeah. I might, um, it wouldn't have helped me. Yeah. Um, because I didn't know it's what high was level. going on. It's like it's hey. high level. Mm -hmm. But I, at that point I knew enough that I could jump into these books and, and kind of pull out their principles. And, mm -hmm. um, uh, what I did was I went to, <laughs> I had always wanted to clerk. I, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to clerk and then I wanted to go into kind of, uh, you know, public interest or government. You know, that was my idea. Um, and I talked to the, uh, well, I don't want to be too, I, I asked the, an advisor, I'll say that. I was like, yeah. look, here's my GPA. Here's what's going on. And she's like, yeah. no, this isn't going to happen for you, Mike. Um, yeah. At this point, you should take as many of the easiest classes you can take and get your GPA up. That's what okay. was the advice. Hmm. And I left that like, no, that's not what I'm going to do. I, hmm. I, you know, if I, this can't all be about grades. That's what I, yeah. that's what I said to myself. I say, if yeah. I take easy classes and, yeah. the, and then go to a judge and he's like, okay, yeah, you couldn't do well with the hard 1L classes. So you ended up taking a bunch of seminars. Yeah, you did fine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but you haven't proven yourself to me. Like you, you just, you know, judges aren't stupid. They, yeah. <laughs> you know, they, they know what's going on. Yeah. Um, and so I said, well, I don't think that's solid advice. So I'm just going to do my own thing. And I um, had a, did not do a law review because um, I wouldn't have made it on, on it to any journal with my grades and my wife was pregnant and we just had our third child. Um, so uh I said, I have to get something on my resume from law school. I have to, you know, to, 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 to put on there that says I can do stuff. And, and so yeah. um, I went and did my 2L year and I took, you know, con law too. I took evidence. I took all the heavy hitting classes. And then I signed up for the spring and I signed up for every class with a practitioner of writing who could write, you know, mm. like um, I took just amazing classes with these appellate lawyers and judges. And that's one thing I would say Georgetown was really cool because you get to take classes with DC circuit court judges um, yeah. telling you how mm -hmm. to write, yeah. um, how to argue, how to do a, a moot. Um, so it was awesome. Uh, and what I did was I just really hammered down on that writing, really mm -hmm. hammered down on it. Um, and I ended up, in that fall semester winning the moot court competition, you know, best brief. Um, and I was a finalist in the oral arguments and hmm. I was getting A's on all my tests. Um, and I was taking classes that were known to be difficult and it wasn't just a give me. And same with 3L, a lot of people kind of start taking their feet off the gas, but if you're not set up, really nice out of your 1L year, that is not the time to take your foot off the pedal. You need to, you know, double down. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm taking classes, you know, I took fed courts I'm taking, you know, and get an A in fed courts. Yeah. Um, and the, uh, so that, so that's going to bring your GPA up. Um, it's also going to look really good on your transcript uh, mm -hmm. because you're taking those heavy hitting classes. Yeah. Um, and then the third component is really, um, making good connections with faculty that you really respect, um, mm -hmm. and just enjoy talking to and, and being around those people, not, you know, just, Oh, I need to do FaceTime, but like really mm -hmm. have a, a, a quality relationship with people mm -hmm. who will then, um, go out and put their name on the line at, when you're applying to jobs, uh, and judges, um, mm -hmm. We're like, yeah, I know he didn't have a, a solid 1L year, but look at what he's done since. And oh, by the way, he's taken two of my classes and I think he's a terrific guy and I think you should hire him. Mm -hmm. um, so there's lots of ways to skin the cat. So, you know, if you're not top of your class at a, at a 1L, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're, you can't bounce back. Um, yeah. But you do need to work on your uh, weaknesses. You need to be honest with yourself about what those weaknesses are. Um, and then you need to work on um, those personal relationships to yeah. get to where you need to be. Hmm. Sorry, that was a long rant, but. No, it's good <laughs> stuff, Mike. I mean, just thinking back about it, it sounds like you bounced back from your 142 and yeah. then you bounced back from your 1L grades. So you get hit down and you don't quit. Yeah. Yeah. I think, um, 
I mean, you went to a movie on your yeah. first LSAT. <laughs> I couldn't even make it to the, you know, the testing center, but look at where you are now. You you're preparing for the bar after going to Georgetown. Yeah. Yeah. It's um I think but I think that's what's important. So it's if you struggle in the beginning, you know, don't give up. Um mm-hmm. if that's something you really want to continue doing. Um but also being honest with yourself about what you need to do to actually advance, actually get to where you need to be. Um, I think a lot of people don't want to do that. Um, it always was bizarre to me. Like people wouldn't ask questions in class Mm -hmm. and I was like, I'm paying so much money. I, I, I should be able to ask questions in class. Uh, you know, and, uh, I have a funny story. I was, I was with a, and I was in fed courts and I was, you know, I asked, two or three questions a class, easy. I was probably yeah. the only one doing it. Yeah. Um, this is and, your third uh, year, right? This is yeah, it was my third after. year. Mm-hmm. And um, I ended up doing really well on that exam. And I ran into the professor the next day and he goes, you did great, good job, you know? And I was yeah. like, oh, thanks. And he goes, yeah, I was really worried about you. <laughs> I, was like, <laughs> <laughs> I was like, why are you, well, you just asked, you know, no one else was asking questions. I just figured yeah. you were, you know, I was like, oh no, I, I think they don't know either. I just think they're scared to ask, you know, clarifying questions. Um, you know, that's actually really interesting because, um, you know, I tutor people all the time and uh, despite the years of doing this over and over and over again, um, when I'm going through a question with somebody, right? And they, they get it right. And I asked a clarifying question, like, why did you choose that answer? And they say something and it makes sense. I kind of assume that everything else around that question or that answer choice, they understand. Mm -hmm. And when I dig deeper, a lot of times there's like, we're like, wait, wait, hold up. What'd you just say about why that other answer is wrong? And it's like, they're wrong. Right. So when people are silent, I'm sure that, that professor is just thinking they must get it. Yep. They understand it. Um, I'm doing um, my job Mike great. just asked that question. Like you don't, but really people don't understand. And how many times do we think we understand, but we don't versus how many times are we just afraid to ask? Right. But sometimes you don't are know. People so nervous to look stupid. Mm-hmm. I mean, I've, I, um, I was blown away by how, yeah scared people are and it was it's been especially in law school to look dumb and Mm -hmm. you don't look dumb at all i mean and if you everyone's just just so nervous about the uh image Mm -hmm. uh, you know that they're trying to cultivate and that Mm -hmm. you know uh they're trying to put you know they think that the professor will look at them like you know they're stupid if they have to ask a question um yeah and I just said it hasn't been my experience, you know, um, that same professor is the person who got me my clerkship. So it just hmm. really isn't the case. Um, now, I mean, don't get me wrong. You can be obnoxious, yeah. you know, <laughs> constantly interrupting while they're lecturing, but, um, you know, that's what office hours are for. Email is for, you know, you can follow up after mm-hmm. if you're really confused about something, but, um, yeah, I, I have found that most people don't know what's going on uh, and they just stay quiet. Uh, and you're just, I don't want to be that person. And, yeah. you know, like studying for these exams, um, you know, I took the MPRE uh, and I'm taking the bar, uh, did the LSAT. Um, you, like you were saying, it's like, you might have a superficial understanding of what's, why you got that question right. Um mm-hmm or you got it down to the two and then you kind of pulled the trigger on one and happened to get it right. Um, mm-hmm. But the people who do best really know, like yeah. they can look at those four answer choices and be like, no, I know this is right. Um, yeah. And I, and I have a full under, and the only way to do that, well, not the only way, but for me is to do multiple practice questions and see how the rule works in real life. Mm-hmm. Um, because the problem with the law is you have this general principle and then you have cases that define that principle in this way, that way, and the other. Um, 
but you really need to apply it to find yeah. out, you know, and, and I heard you guys have like an, a demon now you, yeah. what, what is this? LSAT <laughs> a demon. demon. Yes. Yeah, so that's probably an app description. It's a, uh, it's an AI that we kindly call the demon that is, yeah. Trying to learn your strengths and weaknesses and then give you practice problems at your level. Yeah. I really think that's the best way to take one of these exams. Yeah. Um, just multiple practice questions and mm-hmm. really working, working it. Um, I, I think that's just terrific. Now reading comprehension, I, I'm, you know, when, when it comes to the, the LSAT, uh, mm-hmm. uh, I was terrified cause I'm a slow reader and so yeah. I was rushing through everything and I didn't understand yeah. anything I was reading and I was getting everything wrong. And that's what happened on the exam too. I remember I didn't do well. I, uh, I think they gave us a breakdown. I did not do well in the, uh, the reading comp. Uh, Interesting. Section. So you still did pretty well overall on the test, but kind of yeah, suffered uh, in the reading comp. I wonder what you'd do today. I mean, after all that you've been through, I'm sure your reading is much better. I mean, that's the yeah, one section not, that I feel is most similar to the law school experience, right? Yeah, With it is. Reading. But the difference is, so I'm studying for the bar, right? So I've, mm-hmm. you know, I actually am a pretty strong legal writer now. But um, when you put me under a 30 minute limit on, uh, you know, I have to read a, a page and a half and then apply all these different rules. And, and you're like, in 30 minutes, uh, you know, you get overwhelmed. You're like, I, I can't even think. Yeah. And, and, and it seems like the people who can just do a very superficial skim mm-hmm. and then apply do the best. Um, but that's not me. I have to slowly read the prompt, really understand it, put the issues in my own words in my head, um, and then apply it. And, and it's just, it takes a little longer. So, you know, I don't have as polished of a material in 30 minutes. Um, yeah. Well, I, you know, Mike, I, I don't know that the people who are reading it superficially going quickly are necessarily doing well. You might just be assuming that. I mean, I think in general, people need to really understand it to hit the nail on the head as opposed to just trying to, you know, swing the hammer multiple times as quickly as they can. Yeah, no, I, yeah, yeah. So I think you're, well, you would know you've done this for a long time. Well, for the um, LSAT, at least, I don't know about the bar, but that's. I'm so on. the problem with the, the bar exam, <laughs> the tough part about it with the reading. So I'm, I'm strong when it, when it comes to uh, multiple choice questions, right? So, mm-hmm. you know, little prompts answer, answer. I, I tend to do very well. Um, but the reading comprehension bit i don't know why they put these arbitrary time restraints on 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 it mm-hmm. and expect well i do know why they want to keep their curve or whatever that is but it just when i talk to people who do it um they're just like, no i just read really quickly and then i just you know start slapping things down on the paper but you could be right like maybe i'm you know maybe they actually are are reading and comprehending just like i am uh, at the same speed and everything else and it could be my anxiety taking over and I just feel like I have to rush through it um, mm-hmm. to start typing. Um, I don't know, but I can tell you, so like Barbary has, I'm doing Barbary's bar prep. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think this is really important for test takers that they should think about. You have a standardized how you should attack a test for most people that works a certain way. So like Barbary recommends, you know, whatever they recommend. Um, uh, for me, I found that I kept running out of time doing it the way they wanted me to do it. I didn't have enough time to, to get everything written down. And so I flipped it. I actually looked at uh, another bar exam um, company and they said, look, do it this way instead if this is your problem. you know." Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden I have all the time in the world. So it's really important when you are um, looking at how to take a test to be adaptable and understand that Barbies or some companies are just giving it, you know, the best advice for the most amount of people, but be willing to adapt to your strengths and weaknesses. Um, And uh, so that's what I've been doing now and and it seems to be working, but yeah, I mean, you're probably right. I, I just know that 
when I start reading a prompt, when I start reading under these time constraints, I feel like nothing's going in. <laughs> and uh, I know you guys hammer it home. You're like, look, you got to slow down. If after mm -hmm. that paragraph, what was that paragraph about? If you don't know what it was, then you got to go back because anything you write down or you try to answer a question is going to be gibberish. Um, yeah. But in the heat of the moment, I definitely sympathize with a lot of your test takers that are like, I just got to get through this. Hopefully something <laughs> sinks in and hopefully yeah. I'll be able to spit something out. Yeah. Um, and it's tough. And what's really sad is that's not how lawyers work. Yeah. Uh, you know, all of our exams were like six hours long. Mm -hmm. You know, you just, they want you to write something that is good, you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, Wow, six hours. I, I don't remember ever taking a six hour exam, but did you ever spend that much time on an exam? So I, so each professor is different. Some professors do in class, um, mm -hmm. three hour exams, which I took my con law exam was an in class three hour exam. Mm -hmm. um, but most were um, six to eight hour tests take home. Mm -hmm. um, Open and book. Yeah, you spend every second on that test because you know everyone else is spending every <laughs> second on that test. Yeah, welcome um, to Georgetown, right? Welcome to the top 14. Yeah, and that's another thing. It's, uh, it's very stressful, uh, so you definitely need to take that into account <laughs> when, you're, when you decide to go to one of these more competitive schools. Um, but yeah, you're spending, you know, if you have, you know, I had three kids and a wife that works full time. So it was tough to manage all this stuff. Um, yeah. but, um, definitely, uh, you know, expect to be working your butt off, uh, and expect to take the full eight hours if they give you eight hours. So actually I, I ended up liking three hour exams better. Cause I was like, I just don't, you know, just get in and get out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I want to be done with this. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You lose stamina. I imagine. You're so just tired. What happened? You graduated in May then I guess. And now you're preparing for the bar and the bar got pushed back because of COVID. Is that right? Yeah. So, um, I graduated, I just graduated. Um, and the, we went remote learning in March. So yeah. we went mm -hmm. online. Yep. Um, and then we, uh, you know, you sign, I knew I started studying for the bar in May because I had nothing else to do. We went to pass fail too. So they just started giving us P's mm. for everything. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and then um, I started studying for the bar at the beginning of May uh, to give myself more time because the kids are going to be home. With, we're home, are home with me the whole mm -hmm. time. So mm -hmm. now, you know, it's been tough to study for this thing. Yeah. Yeah. I hear um, you. How old are your kids? 10, 8, and 2. Whoa, two-year-old. Yeah, that's going to be intense. My yeah. youngest is eight. My oldest is almost 16. So it's a little little it's less a, management. Yeah. <laughs> so a two-year-old's lie. Yeah. Hmm. And no daycare. And so it's, yeah. And my wife's a physician, so she's been working this whole time. So Wow. Yeah, that's insane. Um, and well, what's worse is then they put, well, they pushed it. They pushed the exam to October 5th and 6th. Yeah. And so what happened was, you know, we start work, you know, on August 12th and you know, the bar exam, you took the bar exam. It's really yeah. designed for 10 weeks of cramming, mm -hmm. walk in, take the test, you're done. Then you start work. Um, yeah. and you know, hopefully it's all behind you. Um, so now it's been dragging since, so I've been studying since May, June, July, August. It'll be almost like, yeah, five and a half months uh, oh, yeah, kind of like... part-time studying for this exam that we're going to take remotely on October 5th and 6th. And oh, by the way, my kids aren't going to school. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So like, we don't even know what's going to happen now. Um, yeah. And I'll be working full-time. So, so what, what job did you end up getting if you want to share and how? Yeah. So I'm going to be it? clerking with a, uh, a Maryland um, state appellate judge. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. he's on the special court of appeals. He's, he's, um, just a really sweet guy. Um, I'm very happy, uh, to be there. And then I'm going to, um, the DC court of appeals, um, 2021. 20, so after this clerkship, then really? So you've, you've lined up this job and then you've already lined up another job a year from now, essentially. 
Yeah, so the thing with clerkships is you have to be um, at, at state judges. Uh, if you're looking at the appellate side, um, it's a little different for the trial side. You're going to be looking at least a year out mm -hmm. uh, for um, more competitive state judges. You could be looking at two years out. When you say you're looking two years out, you're saying you're applying, you're applying. for those jobs. Yeah. yeah. Two years from now. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And some federal um, judges are two to three years out. So you wow. have to. So they're making their decision when you're a 1L? Yes. That's why 1L grades are so important for. They are your lifeblood. Yeah. yeah. But you um, but recovered that a... from that. <laughs> yeah. So what happened is, but like I said, there's lots of ways to get around it. So you shouldn't get totally discouraged. I think if you don't do well in 1L and you wanted to do the big law thing, that mm -hmm. might be <laughs> off the table for a little bit. Yeah. Um, I don't know how, I didn't do OCI. I didn't look into that. Um, mm -hmm. That was never something I was interested in, but it, that would be tough. Mm -hmm. Workships are a little different because the judges are looking more holistically, but if they're hiring three years out, which some of them are, they're looking at your 1L grades. Yeah. And um that's really all they're looking at. So um, you landed this state clerkship your second year. Yeah. And, and the way it worked was I landed um, that clerkship because I, I applied to a, the DC court of appeals to a, a, a really another wonderful judge. Um, and he was two years out already. I had missed his hiring. Uh -huh. um, so I was already a year out you know, after graduation to, to work for him. Yeah. Um, and so I got, um, this, this job too. And the other thing is I'm, you know, this is where you really have to do your homework where, where you're going to be going to school. I'm in a very competitive area, mm -hmm. uh, for clerkships, obviously. So, yeah. um, it's, you know, really, really difficult to get those federal clerkships. Um, and you know, also, I'm here because my wife works here. Uh, so, so you have to kind of be willing to to look around. Um, mm -hmm. You know. That being said, I also think it's just really important to know who you work for, who your judge mm -hmm. is. If, if you're more interested in just actually learning, um, mm -hmm. it's much more important to find a person that is willing to teach and who really yeah. cares. Um, but yeah, so. So I'm saying in the area, so these are the, the two clerkships that I was um, able to get. Um, and also I was only able to get them because of the relationship I had with um, one of my professors, uh, my Fed courts mm. professor. Um, I imagine who, that catapulted your, your application higher up in the. Yeah. So what aisle, happened was right? I had um, kind of hunted this particular professor down. He's this, you know, he's 80 arguments in the Supreme Court. He's a practitioner. He's a real practitioner. He's not a theory guy. Mm. And I was like, that's what I, you know, really need. I need mm -hmm. practitioners teaching me. And the theorists are great, but they confuse me because I don't know where yeah. they want me to go. It's not that yeah. I don't understand what they're saying. I don't know what they want. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> they probably don't um, know what they want either. <laughs> I know. <laughs> um, and so I... I just wanted to take, you know, all the classes I could with him. And he um, really just, you know, I went to him. I was like, look, teach me how to attack this case. How do you tear apart a brief? How do you, mm -hmm. you know, and he did it. And he just like showed me how to do it. And I was like, that's all I had to do. And he's like, yeah, it's real mechanical. And I was yeah. like, okay, great. I'm just going to start doing that. And um, anyway, I ended up taking two classes with him because I liked him so much. And I applied to this judge on, on the DC Court of Appeals. I had no idea um, that um, they were, they knew each other. I didn't know. Mm -hmm. So I had asked mm -hmm. this professor who I had done well in his classes. I'd asked for a recommendation. He was like, yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. um, and it turned out they were friends or mm -hmm. they knew each other. Um, and so, yeah, that judge just called him right away uh, when he saw his name and said, what, what about what's going on with this guy? And um, my professor said whatever he said. And then, mm -hmm. you know, the judge called me the next day. So I think that's was... huge. And, you know, it sounds like luck in some ways, but given how small the legal world is, I mean, it's a small world, right? So 
the fact that you took the time to create these real connections with this professor and with some other professors, I think that I, I would find it unlikely for you to not end up applying somewhere where someone didn't know somewhere. I, yes, I couldn't agree with you more. It's, <laughs> it's uh, you know, it is a small world and everyone knows each other. And yeah. even if they, they're not best friends, they, you know, they know each other, especially in mm -hmm. DC. It's mm -hmm. all, mm -hmm. all the heavy hitters, but even in your, you know, um, smaller courts, you get to know who the players are and, and who knows who. And, and it's very important um, from starting from your one L year mm -hmm. to know that you're building a reputation Yeah, that people talk, um, you know, be careful what you're posting on the Facebook and, and the Twitter and stuff like that. Uh, mm -hmm. But it's also Mike, I think the fact that you just said the in front of Facebook is going to date you a little bit. Oh, yeah. The Facebook. Oh, yeah. Right. Or it's even not... Facebook, right? I don't, do people even go on Facebook anymore? It's now Instagram. Oh, it's all right. It's all good. It's all yeah, good. I, sorry. I, I sound I... like an idiot all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I've heard anyone say the Facebook or the I was Twitter. out at a dinner. They're like, we were like, we'll split the bill. I was like, great. And they're like, I'll Venmo you. Venmo? Venmo, dude. Venmo. 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 <laughs> okay. I was like, I don't know what that is. Like, you know, just get me back whenever you have the cash. <laughs> like, oh, you don't have the app? I was like, I no, I don't have that. Venmo, yeah. Oh, my. You're funny, it was man. bad, man. Um, no, it's good. You're so nice. You're like, yeah, just, just. Yeah. I was like, <laughs> Um, yeah, that happens to me all the time. There's something else called um, camping, glamping, glamping, glamour clamp camping. Oh, I know something you don't know. Yeah, yeah, you know it. I don't. Yeah, I would. Yeah, met, was that like you go into like a? Is that like these like these boxes that are all nice and but they're like in the woods? Yeah, it's like not real camping. It's like yeah, a hotel yeah, room yeah. in the middle of the woods. Yeah, middle of the woods That's with like, big oh. windows. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. I looked at doing it, but they're always booked around here. So. Yeah, I guess, you know, where there's a market, um, but I had never heard of it. Um, lots of things I have. I've never taken an Uber. You've uh, never taken I an have Uber? never been in an Uber. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I, okay, my challenge for you today is to, to download the app and just Uber somewhere. I tried once. The guy got lost. I was late and I was like, I'll just drive. I, I <laughs> and then they charged me $5 because I wasn't there when I didn't cancel in time. And then I erased the app. And so it was a bad experience. Um, oh, man. But yeah. <laughs> I, I think, um, but most importantly, when you are making these connections, really just go after, just try to find faculty that you actually like, that you really yeah. like, that you really yeah. want to learn from you know, because mm -hmm. that's going to show to them. Yeah. And that sincerity than, will come through. Yeah. Yeah. Cause you're not going there asking for a favor. You're like, I really want to learn. And I think you're the best person to teach me. And mm -hmm. I think that goes a lot long farther than um, just showing up to office hours and asking kind of like superficial questions. You're kind of just yep. wasting and, everyone's time. And if you can back it up with a high grade in their class, then they're going to feel confident in you and your, your competence as well as your sincere sincerity. Cause I do know, you know, some students will befriend professors and those professors will sincerely like them, but maybe not be as confident in recommending them because they're like, Oh, it's a, you know, Joe's a nice guy, but uh, I got a B plus in my class. You know, what can I, when it, what can I say? No, that's a, that's a hundred percent right. You just like you just said, it's a small community, and when these people are recommending you to their friends, mm -hmm. you know they really like you just said. It's like, yeah, he's a great guy, but I don't think he he has what it takes to be in your chambers, you know, because mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. they don't want egg on their face, you know. When, when no. the judge is like, you know, <laughs> why'd you really recommend this guy? Out. What happened yeah. here? <laughs> oh, he was yeah. nice, you know. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it does matter. And you do have to recognize that. Um, and you have to be really hardworking and you have to be really willing to bounce back after messing up. And if you don't have those qualities, uh, I, 
I wouldn't go to law school. I wouldn't mm-hmm. do it. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, because any school you go to, it's going to be competitive. And actually, I've heard, and I don't know if you've heard this, and I was kind of wondering, um, like even in lower tiered schools, the competition is even more intense because of how important it is to be in the top. Um, hmm. You know, so like if you're, th- this could be totally not true. Um, yeah. But it's just very intense because if the big law firm is going to, um, I don't know, um, a school that's, you know, in, in, you know, between 30 and 50 ranked, uh, you know, it's, you really have to be in the top, 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 top of the class, I would assume to, to be able to get the door open. Yeah. Um, whereas in Georgetown, like you're going to be okay. You will get a job, um, yeah. for the most part. Um, that's interesting. I mean, I imagine there is more of a desire to be in the top of your class at these lower rank schools. Cause if you're in the bottom, you're nobody and you've wasted your degree at the same time, the competence of the people you're competing against is going to be, uh, you know, not, yeah, as... it could be easier to rise to the top. Um, and then you could get a really great deal transfer into a higher, higher school, um, you know, and you have done your one L you get, you take those great one L grades cause you were, so I know students who, that have done this and have been very successful. They go to a lower range school um, with every intent to transfer to a higher range school in their second and third year. They don't mm-hmm. pay for 1L. They crush 1L because their competition is, is not as intense. Mm-hmm. They take those 1L grades and then go to Georgetown or wherever. Mm. And really it just, the transcript just talks, you know, you, they don't, you know, it's like all A's. So yeah, like, who cares? Misplaced. Um, I know people have been very, very successful that have done that, which is hmm. another option. The other, another option is I know um, that, you know, debt is obviously should be <laughs> at the top of your mind. Um, but I know for Georgetown specifically, like if you're going public interest, um, essentially Georgetown will pay the loan. Uh, and then the government has a has a uh, forgiveness if you've done public interest or have worked for the government for ten years that they erase the loan, they erase the debt. Um, Are you taking advantage of that by doing the clerkship? Is that? Yeah, I am. Uh, so the two years that I'll be clerking will go to the government towards that count of ten years uh, to eventually mm-hmm. just have my debt, um, you know, uh, waived. Yeah. Um, Georgetown will not pay while I'm clerking because they've decided that people who are clerking usually do well and don't need the money as much, (laughs) but they will pay um, if you end up going to the government or end up going to the, uh, into a public interest firm. And so what they'll do is they'll pay your monthly payments uh, towards that loan for 10 years. Mm. And then at the 10 year mark, it's forgiven. So you've essentially paid, nothing uh you know you've gone to school for free your first two years they're not paying georgetown is not paying they will not pay so you Uh, gotta pay right now i gotta pay right now but um so i'm paying only for what i earn you know it's a percentage and and they look at all that and they it's it's not it's not a huge amount monthly because i'm not going to make a lot clerking Mm. oh so they (laughs) Uh, are paying some i guess Georgetown is? Yeah. No, no. So like they're not doing anything until I get into another government job or a public interest sector. Uh, And then what they'll do is they'll take over those monthly payments Hmm. until that 10 years is up and then it's all forgiven. Hmm. Um, And then you're done. And so, so you've essentially, you know, gone to Georgetown for nothing. Um, but I guess I'd be nervous. Be... I'd always feel like, are they really going to follow through? Is the government <laughs> going to change their minds about their forgiveness? I don't know. No, there's to- yeah, no, there's a lot, you know, can the government change their mind? Yeah. You know, you got to run into that. Um, there are, are you going to be happy in government or public interest? You know, like yeah. you may not want to do that for yeah. that long. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of factors. I'm not saying that should be your only driving factor, but I know a lot of people that like, they went to Georgetown, they're doing wonderful public interest work and they're just mm-hmm. doing their thing. And 
grades didn't matter as much to them. It was, it was all about the work. Um, mm -hmm. And they make great connections, doing really great, great work. And then they, uh, you know, they, their, their loans will be paid. So yeah. they didn't really take a huge risk. Um, but that goes back to what I was saying earlier. You better know what you're going to law school and what you're getting into and what you want to get out of it and where you mm -hmm. want to be when you graduate. Yeah. Um, because if you do not have this planned out, it could turn out. Uh, and I think this is what you guys have talked about. It could turn out very bad for you. Um, mm -hmm. Very bad. Your mountains yeah. in debt and you can't get a job. Um, yeah. You can't pass the bar. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, those are major concerns. Um, yeah. So yeah, you do have to be thoughtful. Very thoughtful. I was not. And I just worked <laughs> out. But I would never want my son or my daughter to do what I did because it would yeah. be crazy. Just like I was married when I was 23. I would never want my <laughs> kids to do that. <laughs> oh, man. I hear you, Mike. I hear you. Uh, I got married when I was 23 as well. Um, did you? Yeah, I did. So you, yeah. were in, you were in law school? Yeah, I was you in got law married? school. Yeah. Uh, no, I, was, uh, I went to law school the year after. What the heck? When did I get married? I got married in 2001. So... Um, yeah, two years later, I was in law school. First son was born while I was uh, a one L. So, that I see was, you know. Yeah, I want to talk to you about this writing thing. Um, yeah, I think that's amazing. Um, yeah, so I, I went. I went to GW right, and actually, uh, Ross was a professor at GW, and I don't remember. I guess he put out a, an application or something or, you know, a job posting. And I said, yeah, I, I can work for you. So I started working for him in law school. And then when I graduated, I kept working for him and did that for a few years and then went into LSAT. So yeah. It was did, a lot of fun. Did, did you clerk? Nope. No, oh, no, I went. Yes, I did actually. Sorry. Yeah. I, uh, when I was a three L I uh, clerked at the DOJ. Oh, oh, but you didn't do a clerkship like uh, no, after not law after school. school. Yeah, just okay. during law school, I think. Gosh, now it's like blurring together. But I was there, um, actually got to be in, I clerked in Deep Throat's office. Deep Throat from the, you know, the, the I guess Nixon Pentagon stuff. Pentagon papers, right? Yeah, stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I don't know. But it was a messy office, huge and... <laughs> It looked like no one cared anymore, but, um, yeah. So that was That's a lot of great. fun. He came and spoke to us. I had took a class with, a uh, judge Millette on the DC circuit and okay. um, who is amazing. Uh, and, and, and her, um, co-professor was a, a, a man named Michael Robinson, who's amazing. And they had him brought Ross come in and speak. Oh, good. And, yeah. And, uh, and I was like meeting my star. I was like, oh my God, ah. you know, like, uh, cause I loved the book so much, you know, and um, yeah. just really, um, so that's really cool. Yeah, it was cool. It was nice. Yeah. I mean, we're still friends. So we, we still talk all the time. I mean, he's just over here in, in Northern Virginia. So no, I, I want to do that. I would love, I was talking with my writing professor who I have a very good relationship with. And uh, I was like, I would love to write something for incoming one else to like how to mm -hmm. crush it, really crush it. Like getting to maybe is a book that's out there. I think it's written by a law professor. Mm -hmm. It's fine. Um, mm -hmm. But like it could be 20 pages long and it could just be yeah. like a real nuts and bolts, how anyone else can, can, you know, get a good footing uh, when they yeah. get into law school. Cause if you don't yeah. have parents that are lawyers, if you, I don't, you know, I, like I said, I, uh, you know, I watch law and order. I, mm -hmm. you know, is that what a lawyer does? I have no idea. Yeah. Um, yeah. so it, yeah, there could be m more help out there. I think that is, is more basic and accessible. Um, oh, write an article, Mike, and then tell us when you've written the article and then we'll bring you back on the show, promote the article. And if there's demand for it, you can write another one. And then, you know, yeah, there you go. 10 articles later, you have a book. There you um, go. <laughs> I mean, I think this has been super helpful. And is there what, I mean, we should probably wrap it up here, but what else, sure. what else? Yeah. Any last words? Um, yeah. Um, 
yeah, sorry if I've been tangential with stuff. Uh, no, that's how this show this. always is. We we have no control over our, um, you know, we don't have yeah. no self control. We just deviate all the time. <laughs> um, but no, I would just say uh, if you are looking into law school, uh, really do get the best LSAT score you can get. Uh, mm -hmm. I would say then apply to the uh, school that meets your needs. And so if you want to be a local attorney, it's probably better to apply to the local school and go for free. Um, mm -hmm. If you want to be uh, working at the DOJ, it's probably better to, to look at the higher ranked schools or big law. Um, and also know financially that, uh, well, it is wonderful to go for free. If that's not going to work for you, there are other options uh, that you can look into uh, with each school and see what they, they have to offer. Um, uh, but, but I think that's it. I, I, I think there are, there are lots of ways to do this and really educate yourself before jumping into, uh, you know, before committing yourself to something that you actually don't want to do or are in the wrong area. Um, you know, it's just all about being thoughtful. Yeah. Your actions. I, one thing I would say, if you do look into these other financial options, don't take the school's word for what the plan is. Maybe ask to talk to people who have actually, you know, leveraged them to see if it's working for them. Right. Because I'd be worried a school would be like, Oh yeah, don't worry. We'll cover that. You know? And it's like, really? Like, what are your conditions? I mean, I think schools have attended like scholarships, right? They're conditional, scholarships and those scholarships sound great when you're talking about oh i'm going to save this much money but at the end of the day you have to maintain a three two which might sound low to some people but then you realize wait three two is above the class median so oh wait this is harder than i thought it's not like a three two and i mean there's a lot of things that people have to be aware of when they're signing you know that dotted line it's not always as easy as it seems that's yes awesome. no no totally um it's like anything else uh you know when we were buying houses right after the bubble burst it's like yeah. you know all these mortgages and the banks you know they, they want your money and they're willing to lie and, <laughs> and, and you can get in hot water pretty quick i didn't have that particular experience with georgetown mm -hmm. uh but um yeah i could see other schools being a little less forthright um, I think you guys had some guy talking about the numbers schools put out and it's not always, um, what they say it is. Yeah. You kind of got to look behind yeah. the curtain to see what's going on. Or it might be um, technically accurate, but you exactly. know, misleading. So exactly. Yeah. Um, so yeah, no, all of that needs to be factored into, but regardless, it, you'd need to make an informed decision. So whatever it is, multiple sources, um, before you make that decision. Um, yeah. and that's not to say, like I said, if you can get, into a great school and go for free. That's the way to do it. Mm -hmm. um, but if that's not going to get you to where you want to be, um, you know, there, there are other options. There are other things you can look into. Um, yeah. But yeah, I think that's it. Cool. Thanks, Mike. Thanks for taking the time. I All hope right, you can man. get out to the beach. I know your family is probably waiting like, what, where did Mike go? What? Yeah. We're going to go, go out there. Yeah. Um, again, that was B Mike Bongiorno. Did I say that right? That's right. Mike good. Bongiorno. It's a uh, good morning in Italian. Bongiorno. Bongiorno. Okay, good. There you go. That was, um, oh yeah. If you're, uh, just joining us, you can always, uh, join the thinking LSAT podcast group on Facebook. You can follow us on Instagram at thinking LSAT also at LSAT demon. Um, and on Twitter, you can follow us at the same handle at Thinking LSAT or Nathan at NFox. Um, our joint project is the LSAT Demon, which we briefly talked about, Mike. And the podcast website is thinkinglsat.com. That was episode 258 of the Thinking LSAT podcast. Thanks all y'all for listening. Nice knowing you. Don't pay for law school.